Folks, we look at the attacks against African Americans and others across the country. Uh, you have uh, these folks uh, who are neo segregationists. The issue is, how are they being funded? Well, today, Color Change launched a campaign against Goldman Sachs Foundation, Fidelity Charitable, Swap Charitable, Vanguard Charitable, and National Philanthropic Trust. They say that they are funding groups, individuals like Christopher Rufo, Stephen Miller, Chris Kobach, and Ed Bloom. Uh, Color Chain says they've received some $24.5 million from these groups in the last several years. Joining us right now is Rashad Robinson, who is the president of Color of Change. Rashad, glad to have you here. So, Rashad, walk us through this. And so, how are they funding these hardcore uh, right wing neo segregationists who are attacking? a number of programs that specifically benefit African-Americans and others. Thanks for having me, uh, Roland. So basically, you know, we've been working with researchers and others for quite some time, really looking into how these folks, as well as other white nationalists and other white nationalist sympathizers, are getting their money. And what we've been able to identify is that, you know, at these institutions, Goldman, which you named, uh, Fidelity, uh, Vanguard, National Philanthropic Trust, they host things called uh, donor advised funds, these funds where people put their money in and they're able to move it without a lot of sort of fanfare uh, behind the scenes, oftentimes getting uh, 501c3 write offs, um, tax uh, benefits for giving this money, and, um, and not a lot of transparency. And so money goes to these places. Uh, Goldman employees are sometimes given matches uh, for putting money into these donor advised funds, meaning they put money in and then the company puts money uh, behind uh, their money, uh, doubling or tripling those donations. And what we've um, watched over time um, as a result is now you have this well-organized, well-financed, um, sort of secretive um, you know, program of funding the very people who are attacking us. Meanwhile, uh, when Goldman or these other companies say they're supporting us or supporting black-owned companies, they launch big press releases. And then when they come under attack, they slowly and quietly pull back that money, all while giving money to the institutions funding us. It is the kind of ultimate uh, trick bag that we're being put in. And I think it's really important that we hold these institutions accountable, that we highlight this, that we raise it with employees. But most importantly, Importantly, we raise it with people who are putting their money in that we're not going to let them do this in silence. So, again, for people who don't quite understand, uh, yeah. and I have been saying this uh, on this show, trying to people understand, you have a well-connected, well-funded effort that is targeting black folks at all these different programs. This is not just happenstance when you look at these lawsuits, when you look at how they're raising their money, uh, when you look at uh, where the money is coming from, you have folks with significant positions who are doing this and they are specifically attacking programs that help African Americans. None of these people are working for free, Roland. And so part of, you know, what I've always looked at, and you know this because we've um, come on and talked, we've talked about this stuff for years, is that you always do have to follow the money because the infrastructure is being supported. I mean, they're going after our money, right, in some ways. They're going after the supports and the infrastructure. The attack on the Fearless Fund is an attack on a piece of infrastructure that is trying to make it uh, create economic opportunity for black women, right? And so they're not doing Doing this without resources and with support. And some of the same people in the institutions that say that they love us, that say that Black Lives Matter, that pledged all sorts of money and support, have now sort of turned around and are now moving money to our very opponents. And, and it, it may seem like they're playing both sides, but they're actually not. Um, it's been $24.5 million that we've been able to sort of identify that's gone to neo-segregationists and related groups just from these sort of four sort of charitable uh, trust. When we get on the phone with, let's say, a Goldman Sachs, what something they'll say to us is like, oh, we know that some of our money went to um, you know, uh, Ed Blum or Stephen Miller or Chris Kobach. Um, we, we know that some of our money went there, but we also donated money to black women. 
as if donating money and supplying resources to black women organizations is the other side of donating to white nationalists. It's also just an offensive affront that there that there's like two sides to the story of white nationalists. There's two sides to the story of segregation. There's two sides to the story of closing the door to educational opportunities, closing the door to employment opportunities, closing the door to government contracts, because that is exactly the sort of world that these neo segregationists are trying to promote. And they're promoting it with dollars and money from people who, um, you know, stand up during Black History Month and try to claim that they're supporting us. Well, and when you talk about uh, Goldman Sachs, and so they announced this, you know, big fund helping black women, but that's the very type of programs that Ed Bloom is trying to get rid of by suing. Absolutely. So, you know, and this is actually the trick, Goldman. I mean, this is, this is actually the trick that Goldman is putting to us, right? Because it's almost like they announce these programs, they fund the people who who are um, attacking the programs, they don't fully fund the programs, and they say they can't fully fund them because the programs are now illegal. But they funded the whole sort of process to make them illegal in the first place. So that what they do is they sort of look like they are supporting us, they try to get credit from our community, and then when the, communi- when the programs can't actually be implemented or fully funded, they say, oh, that's not us. We wanted the programs the whole time. We just can't actually do it because of new restrictions or new laws, but not telling us that they actually funded the process to get to those restrictions, to get to those laws, because they actually, at the end of the day, didn't really want a world of diversity. And you only have to look at sort of their senior level management. You only have to look at sort of the people in the most senior level positions of power in these companies to say that they have done an awful job of diversity in their own house. So um, this funding um, or these claims of funding um, that are starting to dry up are not just a mistake. They're drying up because it's fully the intention of these companies to never have to fully make good on these commitments. So, So this campaign, what are you trying to achieve? What do you want folks watching and listening to do? So we want you to go to colorofchange.org. We want you to sign uh, the petition. What we are doing is we're now raising attention around these donor advised funds. Over the coming weeks, we're going to be sort of exposing more donor advised funds. We're in behind the scenes conversations with these companies. We will be um, also trying to unearth the donors that are, um, you know, putting money into these funds, but also putting folks on notice. Part of the challenge that we have, Roland, is that the only people that we see speaking right now and pushing back is the other side. They're going after our resources and our money. And Color of Change is a national civil rights organization that doesn't raise money from these corporations. We're fully focused on what does it mean to hold them accountable. And so we will be pushing back. We will be exposing their donors. Um, We'll be engaging with attorneys generals in states because some of these companies made really big statements in 2020 about the money they were giving to uh, black um, uh, equity and black um, equality and uh, didn't make good on some of those commitments. But when making those commitments, they got all sorts of uh, stock bumps. They got all sorts of publicity. And they didn't make good on their fiduciary responsibility to actually deliver on those commitments that they made public. So part of this strategy is really shining a light and shedding a light. It is making sure that um, there are a lot of people who have their money inside of donor advised funds at Goldman and Fidelity and Vanguard. And we've seen this over the years after um It was exposed that a number of the people, uh, the donor advised funds at Fidelity, were funding groups that were involved in Charlottesville in 2017 and other sort of white nationalists. We launched a campaign and engaged to get people to move their money if Fidelity didn't change their behavior. We know some of these donor advised funds have changed some of the relationships they've had to funding things like guns and other things. So we know they can make changes um, when pressured and when pushed. And now is an opportunity because the world is changing. And the question is, is what side are they going to be on? And we cannot, um, you know, expect these companies to do the right thing if we don't demand it. But also, I think what has to happen is we, we as black folks have got to stop excusing people under the guise of, oh, let them secure the bag. 
<laughs> and, 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 I, and I guarantee you, they got people, some people are going to say, oh, Rashad, you know, look, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, but, you know, they're doing some good things uh, with some brothers and sisters. They're funding some organizations. They're, they're cutting some checks. And so, you know what? Uh, I, you know, y- y'all really shouldn't go after these folks. That that literally is a mindset uh, yeah. that we see in, in, in our community a lot. Well, as black people, we have to see ourselves as powerful in these conversations. We have to um, demand what we deserve and be unafraid to demand what we deserve. Um, Right now, we are watching uh, the Jewish community take no prisoners um, on the issues that they believe impacts their communities. We've watched LGBT communities hold companies accountable and take no prisoners when it comes to um, issues and investment. And we cannot actually have companies speak out of both sides out of their mouth to us. You actually get treated the way you make you demand people to treat you. And that is be part of the conversation, right? They do need our communities. They do need to invest in our communities. We are here and we have resources. But along the way, this is not um, about us sort of thanking them and appreciating them. This is about us consistently demanding more because along the way, we deserve more. And that has actually been part of the conversation. Um, and so we shouldn't think about this um, as like, what is the floor? But we actually have to really look at what is the ceiling and continue to sort of focus on the ceiling. And so I actually do hope that the campaign that we are running and we are pushing does unlock more opportunities and more resources for black women, for black entrepreneurs, for black men entrepreneurs, for black young people, for the range of our community who deserves a fair shot at equity. And at the same time, we can say that you can't come for our money by day and take away our opportunity for advancement and education and jobs and equity by night. You can't say that you're investing in us one minute and get awards on our stages and then turn around and give money to the very people that are trying to turn us backwards, uh, trying to close the doors to opportunity. And that, I think, is incredibly important because these projects that they say they fund have opportunities to bring us forward. But They are funding so many things right now that have so much potential to drag us in the past. And we can't turn a blind eye to it just because we think there's some sort of bag at the other end. Because what we've known and what we've seen over over the years is that black capitalism alone will not save us. That the rules are so often designed, um, are so often set up to put us in harm's way. And if we don't change the rules, and if we don't hold the rule makers accountable, and if we don't do the work to make sure that we are also the rule makers over time, then that's not actually the work of civil rights and racial justice. That's the work of appeasement and really just trying to be in the room um, when there's so much opportunities for us to build our own rooms. All right. Tell folks where to go for more more information. Go to colorofchange.org. You can sign up there. You can engage. You can go to Color of Change on Twitter, Color (laughs) of Change on Instagram. There's information on the petition and the campaign. Please share and sign and elevate and amplify the work that we're doing here. Um, you know, we are facing some of the biggest uh, corporate institutions and biggest donors um, in the world. And we know that our voice is powerful in these conversations. They were, they, the only reason why we have to expose this right now is because they were trying to keep it secret. And so the work to expose it is critical. And by exposing it and getting more of us to expose it, I believe we have an opportunity to change the, the path forward. All right. Rashad Robinson, Color Change. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Always appreciate you, Roland. Thank you. COVID happened, poor people were dying at a rate already of 800 people a day before COVID. If you went to a funeral every single day, it would take you 600 years to attend all the funerals of the people who will die from the ravages of policy, violence, poverty, and low wages in America in just one year. It would take you two years and 19 days to go to all of the funerals of the people that will die today and oftentimes Silence. Nobody talks about this political genocide. But we are determined today to remember their death 
and be a resurrection of voting power and voice power like never before. Economic justice and saving this democracy are deeply connected. We, as a nation, must listen to the demands of the poor who are pushing and will continue to push political candidates and elected leaders to lift from the bottom so that everybody can rise. We are the poor, the marginalized, and the underpaid. And we are taking one step forward to say that everybody has a right to live. Poverty is not the fault of those who are impoverished. It is caused by those who make the policy. There are over 135 million poor and low-wage, low-income people in this nation. The biggest block of potential voters by far is low-income, low-wage voters. I can't afford medicine. Sometimes I have to skip because of the cost. The farm worker community is tired of the violence imposed upon us by greed, exclusion, and denial of basic human rights. Those folk that represented by that casket, poor and low-wage workers who are the most moral people in this country because they go to work every day believing, even though going to work is hazardous to their health. I'm tired of working 70 to 80 hours a week and still not have money for the necessity of bills. I'm tired of getting sick and not being able to go see the doctor. Having to make a choice to pay between rent or the light bill or food or clothes. You cannot claim to care about families and a culture of life and then do everything in your power to rob people of equal access to resources and to force them to live in poverty. Leadership of both parties that waged war on poor people and low wage workers. And this government has treated people experiencing poverty, including their military families, with disdainful, deliberate, malicious neglect. So the truth is that my son died from poverty. We refuse to accept poverty as the fourth leading cause of death. The fourth leading cause of death in this, the richest country in the world. We march today for our children and the generations to come. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. We will voice our demands and register our vote. When we stand up and when we stand together, things change. Right. There is the electorate that is, and then there is the electorate that should be. 34 million eligible poor and low-income voters did not vote in 2016. If just 20% of those voters in swing states were mobilized around an agenda, they could change the political outcome of every election. So we're launching the most massive voter mobilization and turnout campaign in history of poor and low-wage voters, allies, and religious leaders. People are dying, but we know it doesn't have to be this way. And so we are calling on everyone to join us in this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are here, we will be seen, we will be heard, and our power will be felt. We don't need to be an insurrection. We are a resurrection that will be felt across this country. Are you ready? 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 We are a resurrection, and we are ready. Yeah.